I'd like to welcome you to tonight's reading, sponsored by the Friends of the Scranton Public Library Poetry Series. And uh, we are here partly through the generosity of the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, uh, Lackawanna County Arts to the People program, and a few other sources, one important one being the contributions that we get here tonight. So if you missed the basket, please find it. Um, I've also been asked to uh, announce an event, upcoming event that's going to be here on Saturday night, sponsored by Mowbray Poets and Writers Organization. A man, a poet named Carl Parker from New York City is apparently going to be giving a talk called Creating a Minor Literature or Minor Literatures. And there will also be an open reading. So uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Mowbray Poets readings, uh, it's probably going to be an, a good event. That's this Saturday night. I was asked to announce that the kitchen will be closing down for the duration of this reading, but will be opening up afterwards. Very pleased tonight to have Jim Daniels reading for us. Uh, he's a professor of creative writing at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, author of three books of poetry, Places Everyone, Punching Out, and M80. And his fourth book is going to be published by the University of Pittsburgh this coming spring called Blessing the House. He's also put together and edited an anthology called Letters to America, Contemporary Poetry on Race. He was born in Detroit and uh, comes from a family, many members of which worked in the automobile industry there, and as he did too at one time. And much of his poetry tells the stories of people working in those factories. Um, for that reason, He's been understandably compared with poets like Philip Levine and James Wright, who have also dealt with that kind of subject matter. Uh, but of course, his poems are also about many other things and, and expand out beyond just telling the story of working people's lives, exploring concepts of uh, how violence and prejudice and so on uh, come from that environment. And more than that, too, as well, which I'm sure you will find out as we listen to him. I'm very pleased to present Jim Daniels. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I thought I would read the title poem of my new book, Blessing the House, first, because I'm going to try and take you through the reading back to my home in many ways. <clears throat> this is about going back home after being away for a long time, pulling up in front of the house. Blessing the House. I step out of the house and stare at the flat houses with their bristly bushes, wild and short like my old hair. I want to cut my hair and spread it over the snowy yard like my own ashes. I want to curl inside a sidewalk square, my ear to the ground, cupped, listening. What could I bring back to life? Would I hear the rough chalk scrawl over cement? This house the priest blessed over 30 years ago when the lawn was mud and boards. Bless this house, I think, standing in the street. The wind blows cold, but I know this wind, its harsh front. Don't, don't try to bully me, I say. I am home and my hands are trembling. I am sighing. The car door slams. I clap my hands for the hell of it. A clap on a street corner, echoing a little among friends. Once I stood here for hours trying to hit the street light with a snowball to leave a white smudge. I have left no smudge, nothing I could call mine. The gray sky presses down on these small houses, on my parents' house in its square slab. They are inside, maybe changing, changing the channel on the TV, maybe grabbing a beer and a bowl of chips, maybe flushing the toilet, maybe scrubbing their faces, maybe peering out a dark window. I am waiting to step inside for the hug and the kiss. I am waiting to push away this gray sadness, cement, and sky. I grab a handful of snow and touch it to my forehead where it melts down my face. I smudge my chest with an X of snow. I toss handfuls on the yard on the scraped sidewalk, ashes, ashes, glowing in the streetlight before the melting, the disappearing. Oh, glorious snow, I say, we have missed each other. I listen for a moment. I lift my bags from the trunk. The porch light glows its yellow basket of tender light. I stomp my boots and I go in. As a way of, I guess, continuing sort of introduction, I'll read some poems about some, some people in my family. First poem I'd like to read is, uh, of the, these is called Anthem. My father worked for Ford Motor Company until he retired. And when we were growing up, 
he wasn't around very much. It was during the boom of the auto industry, so he was working six, seven days a week, 10 hours, 10, 12 hours a day. And he came to visit me, and we went to this football game after his retirement. And it, during the national anthem, it occurred to me that I didn't think I'd ever heard him sing before. Anthem. Two months after retirement, my father is here to get away from 6 a.m. in his cup of empty destination. At a football game, we huddle under his umbrella talking about the obvious. He brings me coffee to hold warm between my hands, a gift of no occasion. When we rise for the anthem, I hear the rusty crack of his voice for the first time maybe ever. 33 years of coughing thick factory air, of drifting to sleep through the heavy ring of machinery of 12-hour days. In my sleep, I felt the cold bump of his late night kiss. I shiver in the rain as my father sings me what now I hear as a children's song. I lean into him, the umbrella in rain, my excuse, my shoulder against his, and I imagine my mother falling in love. Seems like that's one of the hardest things to do is imagine your parents falling in love sometimes. It was hard to get my father's attention during those years, and this next poem is about one of my mother's attempts to get his attention. It's called My Mother's See-Through Blouse. <clears throat> A rare night out, my older brother babysitting the rest of us. My mother emerged from their bedroom in a see-through blouse, her plain white bra clearly visible. What was she thinking? To wake up my father's numb shuffle, I guess. What was she thinking? My father looked up, jumped, spilled his coffee. I was 13 and couldn't look. My father didn't yell. He paced and shook his head. He opened his mouth. He closed his eyes. He made fists. He sent us to our rooms. What were you thinking, he asked her. I can pile up the facts. My father was never home. They were both 40. She cried. They went nowhere. We never saw the blouse again. It was rose-colored. My mother had one of her dizzy spells. She lay in bed all weekend. My father made us pancakes the next morning, and they weren't bad. He didn't say much kept looking at his watch. Your mother's sick, he said, and we knew. Through the cracked door, I saw him sitting on the edge of their bed. I couldn't see her. Nobody said a thing. Something might have happened, but the next day was back to work and overtime. Someone had to cook and clean, and it was my mother. Who loved her? We all did. I lay sleepless that night, wanting her normal. I didn't want to see through. Your mother gave us a scare, my father said. I nodded and ate my pancakes, guzzling my milk to get the dry pieces down. And this next poem is uh, called How. It's for one of my brothers who's a truck driver. If I had a longer title, it would probably be How Did I Ever Screw My Life Up Like This, which I guess is a question we all ask ourselves at various times. It's about the breakup of his marriage. How he proposed to her at a train crossing as she sat behind him on his Harley, but she didn't hear him above the train's roar, and he bumped his helmet against hers when he turned to repeat the question, shouting it, indisputable after months of hedging, and how he turned forward again, waiting till she said yes, and how he wanted to kiss her, but the train was gone, so he revved up and crossed the bumpy tracks and how his wife was leaving him now after 15 years, and how he'd messed up bad a few years back with another woman, and how she kept throwing that in his face again now suddenly, because this time it was her, her in love with someone else, tooth for tooth, stick in the eye. And how driving the truck lately, he wanted to not slow down on some exit ramp, keep barreling on till he was dead, and this was over. And how his older boy suspected something, and what could he ever say to him, his family crumbling into pebbles, then fine dust, and how he couldn't breathe without choking, and how they were the only couple still married among their high school friends, and how shocked everyone would be, and how he gave her diamond earrings for their anniversary last month, and how she cried knowing it was no use, and how on the road in the truck he imagined her with the other faceless man, and how strangely he could sleep now, the insomnia gone, how sleep was his escape, and how he daydreamed about the peace of sleep, about how he wished he'd never given up the guitar and how he'd been safety boy of the year when he was 10 years old and how that's the last time he got an award for anything and how he knew he was feeling sorry for himself but couldn't help it. And how he'd given up all drugs, even pot, because he wanted something to be clear. 
and how he'd stayed with his wife, broken off his affair, a final choice, and how relieved he was not to have the guilt scraping at his insides, but how she'd brought the guilt back now, and it still worked, how it still dug and bulldozed, and how he wished he'd tried college 15 years ago instead of marrying, but how he still loved his wife no matter, and how he'd always loved driving, her hands on his waist on the back of the bike, and how he'd cured his restless heart, but now she'd caught it and it wasn't going away and how riding his Harley, it just seemed light and empty, the breeze stinging his face, the helmet too tight, and how he loved his kids and, and took them fishing, though one got seasick, and how he cradled the sick one's damp head as he bent over the side of the boat, gentle, and how he wanted someone to cradle his head just like that, and how he wished he could vomit up all the badness and be done with it, and how he was disappointing his parents one more time, and how he was looking for a new job because business was bad, and how he was 40 years old and the skin on his face was tightening into creases, and how his beard was sprinkled with gray, and how tired he was and just wanted to sleep, but he had at least four more hours of driving, and how he picked up his CB and pressed the microphone and said, hey, hey, anybody out there? <laughs> so I read you the title poem of this book, <clears throat> M80. M80 is a firework. And I think it's about like a quarter stick of dynamite. So, a great attraction for us when we were kids. Uh, this poem has a couple things running through it that I might mention. One is the assass assassination of Robert Kennedy, and the other is one of my first kisses. So there's some big jumps in here. <coughs> Robert Kennedy shot. Early June, my mother prayed the rosary in front of the hollow crucifix in her room that slid open to reveal death candles hidden for last rite's blessing. They got used soon enough. She prayed a long time. My father wanted dinner. We ate mac and cheese. Wipe your mouth. You got that orange stuff all over it. You're a big boy now. Try to eat right. A day when everything stuck to my face. My 12th birthday postponed. My mother whispered through tears. Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, Debbie said, balancing on the curb. She wore a white blouse, shirt tail out over cutoffs. She drew a blue heart on her tennis shoe. I wanted to fill it in. What could we do in the gray light of clouds and broken glass, the stale wads of gum clutching against our teeth? It was after a rain and we rode through puddles. It was a banana, banana seat stingray. It was one speed and one speed only. She rode behind me on the seat, her thin legs swaying just above the ground. We bought Twinkies and orange crushes at the store. I said, I have an orange crush on you. She laughed. The sun was going down somewhere. My birthday got rained out, I told her, assassinated, our laughs short, hollow. Why does everybody hate everybody, Debbie asked. Her parents had just split. I don't hate you, I said. Look at you, she said, and put down her crush, licked the cream around my lips. An M80 went off in my chest, at least it seemed that way. I bought five of them from Artie Polkowski, saving them for the fourth. But I would use one soon enough to blow up a mailbox. I was not immune. Artie lost part of his hand that summer, another of those hard way lessons we kept hearing about. Behind the store, we held each other and kissed birthday kisses, even after it was dark, even after it rained some more. I kicked up my kickstand and rode her home under the blue streetlights. She held on tighter than I've ever been held. My brother stood in the corner smoking with his friends. Junior's got a girlfriend, they chanted. We were fierce and serious as I pedaled past. <coughs> My mother was praying again, and the TV was off. I knelt beside her, my elbows sinking into the soft bed, offering up my small explosions. The next one I'd like to read is called uh, Crazy Eddie. A lot of neighborhoods seem to have a Crazy Eddie. It's an, somebody who <coughs> is sort of a grouch, and so you torment him, and he becomes more of a grouch, and you get this vicious circle going. But when we were kids, we also had, we had Crazy Eddie and we had this other older couple. If you went on their porch, they would give you candy. And so they were like the nice people and Crazy Eddie was the mean guy. And as I grew up, I saw things a little differently, had a different perspective on both of them. Crazy Eddie wasn't crazy. He was a drunk garbage man with a bad temper. He shot Porter's pigeons for shitting on his garage, the Porters who had no kids, and gave us each a sucker if we stood on their porch and sang their name, Porter, like Porter, like good little boys. 
They dressed their dog Pee Wee in tiny sweaters, gave him his own room. They built a high stone wall between their house and Eddie's. He took our balls when they landed in his yard, all box of them we saw through a basement window. In his bright white t-shirt and green work pants, in his gre greased back hair and beer gut, thick forearms and squint and scowl, he drenched his lawn in toxic fertilizers. His two daughters played alone on the sidewalk. He set fire to the field behind his house where we played ball. Crazy, crazy Eddie, we shouted, running past his house midnight. Devil's night, he hid in the bushes with a pellet gun. His cigarette glowed. We didn't know then he picked up trash for a living and drank 12 beers a night. Maybe all he wanted was a green lawn and a peaceful drunk. Years later, I worked in a beer store where every day he brought his empties. He said hello to me then and thank you. I handed him his change, looked him in the eye. I'm the one who burned fuck you into his lawn. Maybe we just weren't smart enough then to know who to hate. A bucket full of balls, the only wealth we understood. Hauling garbage all day, the stinking mess of it. A perfect lawn. What did we know? Just a bunch of kids learning that you had to sing. Sing for your candy. So we're all still singing for our candy, I think. Uh, this next one is called Parked Car. It's about the breakup of a high school romance, or at least I thought it was when I wrote it, and then it turned into a, what I hope is a different sort of love poem. Parked car. Fred, Fred and I, drunk in stone, drove around laughing like we did in the old days before I met Karen. Then I said, drive by Karen's, and he said, are you sure? Then he said, okay, like he was tired and didn't want to end up bailing me out again. She'd given my ring back a month ago. I knew she had a date. A car was parked where I always park. Fred pulled in on the other side of the street. We sat there. There's no one in that car, Fred said. No one in the car. No lights in the house. I squinted hard through the dark, saw a head pop up above the seat, then down again. I reached for the door. There's no one in the car. We're leaving now, Fred said. He put his hand on my shoulder, gentle, firm. I turned to stone, then crumbled, wanting her and not wanting her, while Fred drove me home. I held my open hand out the window against the cold wind. Twelve years ago. Today, in a moment, rain changes to snow. Maybe it was Fred I loved that night. We'd have never called it that, and I still wouldn't to his face. That small touch during the years when none of us ever touched each other. Sometimes I still drive by that spot with my wife, who doesn't know the ghost living there. We don't kiss in cars anymore. Karen married, moved away. Ah, heart, hearts. Mine and yours, yeah, all of you. The times you've given it away for chump change. The heart, the fist. If you're lucky, someone grabs your shoulder. I'd like to read a few poems that are set in various uh, workplaces. These first two are set in uh, a fancy department store where I worked as a stock boy. This one's called For People Who Can't Open Their Hoods. I always felt that if you owned a car, you should at least be able to open your hood. In, the, in Detroit, there was a real sense of pride that you could fi actually fix just about anything that went wrong with your car. So if you couldn't open your hood, I mean, that was the worst insult. For people who can't open their hoods. Some fat lady in a mink storms in, says her car won't start, left her lights on. Got her son outside with cables, but they don't know how to open the hood. Because I'm head stock boy, because she's a good customer, they send me out to help her. I grin at the two of them, son fat as mother, shaking pink cheeks in the cold, cables dangling from his gloved hands. He hands them to me like they're dead snakes. I pop open the hood of the mother's new Grand Prix. And I stand aside yapping, not even looking at me. I stir up the son's Cadillac and sit behind the wheel for a while. They look at the mother's packages I'd carried out minutes before without getting a tip. I rev it up, my foot to the floor, while I check out the plush interior, interior, st interior stereo tape deck, digital clock, cruise control, power everything. I beep the horn. They stand in the cold, suddenly looking at me. I put the car in reverse and back out to move in position for the jump. I put it in drive and grip the wheel, and for one long moment, 
They think, I think, I will drive away. Uh, this, this next poem is set in the same workplace, but it's part of a longer poem about race and racism. This excerpt, which I hope stands on its own, uh, is about an interracial romance. I mean, oh, the, the central uh, image in this is those fo foam packing chips that come in gift packages and are totally unbiodegradable. In the department store, those foam packing chips that last forever poured from an overhead funnel into gift boxes full of vases, clocks, books, ceramic dogs, martini glasses, china, silver, to cushion and protect. Kim's dark skin surrounded by the white, white foam. We worked in that blizzard together. We leaned across the table toward each other in the basement under the store where all the black people worked, along with me and another white kid. We felt like robots down there filling and sealing till our eyes locked in the hard stare of mannequins. We ate lunch together in the lounge. People talked. It only took me a year to ask her out. Dixie scowled. This is Detroit. What are you doing? We went to a movie in my part of town for coffee in her part. I can't remember what we saw because I held her hand in the dark and we were alone there just like two white kids or two black kids. All night the stairs bit into us like tiny bugs we couldn't see. Walking to the car, I squeezed her hand into a fist. I guess you have to be rich to get away with it, she said, and maybe she was right. Her own sizzling skins could not, her own good fire could not blend or overwhelm or distract or soothe enough. We were not rich enough or fast enough, fat enough or thick and thin enough. We could not slam our car doors loud enough to break the long stare. In her apartment, her child up cried upstairs while we held each other in the couch. Go home, white boy, somebody yelled when I got in my car. At work the next day, the foam rained down between, it, between us. It lay in heaps. I couldn't look at her. I grabbed two handfuls and squeezed. Nothing can destroy them. I picked to read a few poems set in um, an auto plant. It was a Ford Axle plant, actually. Some of these might have some axle images in them. The first one of these I'd like to read is called Factory Love. For anyone who's done shift work before, I don't know if you had this experience, but you know, somebody else is doing your job when you're not there. And after a lot of overtime and long days, <coughs> things would get a little blurry. And some days when I'd come in and my machine would be messed up, or something would be out of place, I get the strange feeling that was something like a perverse form of jealousy for the other uh, people who were working the machine when I wasn't there. So I wrote this love poem from my machine. 800 is the production number. You're supposed to make 800 parts every day. Machine, I come to you 800 times a day like a crazy monkey lover, in and out, in and out, in and out. And you, you hardly ever break down such clean welds, such sturdy parts. Oh, how I love to oil your tips. Machine, please come home with me tonight. I'll scrub off all the stains in your name, grease and graffiti. I'm tired of being your part-time lover. Let me carry you off into the night on a high-low. That guy at midnights, I know he drinks and beats you. And another thing that happens, Ty is attacking me. Uh, is that when the assembly line would break down, you had a few minutes to try and be a human being for a while, but <clears throat> there's a real rhythm to the, to the work and to the machines that would carry over. So even when things would break down your body, you'd still be hearing the same rhythm of the machines. I tried to capture that a little bit in this poem, which is called Factory Musical. The whole line broke down, she was all standing around, and Spooner picked up two welding sticks and started banging away on an axle housing, playing that factory beat. All of us gathered round. It was a Friday. Clapping hands and old Paul P. Plump and slow in coveralls, tapping one foot and then the other, shaking and dancing round and round and singing a song in another tongue. Nita started a disco dance and Odie dance and hoedown style was hopping and bopping all down I'll see. The foreman came but laughed and shrugged and clapped in time with the factory beat. Just drums, no horns, no strings, just boompa, tappa, boompa, tappa. 
And our man Spooner moved around, tap, tap on the floor, boom, 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 on machine, and the welding helmet of old Paul P. Like Hollywood, we all dance and shout and go, go, go. Even old Jess, ready to retire, managed to smile his dance. We all so proud and flaunt and sweating, music pounding inside, until all of a sudden it was time to return to the line. Another big thing about the work was that you couldn't, you, you couldn't hear anybody when uh, all the machines were up and running, so a lot of people communicated in sign language. And so this poem is called Signing, and it's a list of all the different sign language that I could remember. I'll try and do the signs for you uh, as we move along through it. Signing. Lunch. Open your mouth, put your hand in front of it, rapidly open and close the hand. Need paint, slap paint across your face with a big brush. Need high-low, steer steering wheel, brake, snap an arm in two. Need banjo housing, strum one. Need housing covers, draw a circle around your head. Need cigarette or joint, fingers to lips. Need drink, thumb in air, fingers and fist, raise to lips. Need welding sticks, play drums. Need overhead crane, point to raft or twirl finger. Faster, finger twirling in circle, slower, hands pushing down. No, you know that one. No way, point to crotch. Foreman coming, tighten a tie. Machine broke down, point to machine, thumbs down. Disgust, wave hand down and away. Fuck you, you know that one. <laughs> the last of these is a shorter one called Old Green. The nicknames were pretty basic. Old Green was a guy who wore green overalls when everybody else wore orange or uh, gray. Old Green stops to say goodbye, retiring after 43 years. No green coveralls today. Dressed in street clothes, hair slicked back, even manages a shy smile as I shake his hand. The company gave him an aerial photo of the plant, and all the guys signed their names around it, and good luck. All you can see is the roof and the parking lots and the tiny, tiny cars. As hard, as, hard as you look, you'll never find him. This is an actual retirement gift because we have one of these in my basement. An aerial view of a factory. Can you imagine what that looks like? <laughs> Just a big box. Let me read a poem about being out of work. It's called Broke. Uh, appropriately enough, I suppose. I don't know what the laws are. Well, we're in, we're in Pennsylvania here where you have to get your cars inspected. And in Michigan, yeah, they have what they call a transportation special. So uh, it, it means it runs. And uh, <coughs> people take a perverse pride in driving things that you say, does that thing really run? <coughs> Broke. I-75 near Livernois, my 68 satellite dropped its drive shaft. I guzzled my beer, though I wanted to puke thinking about the money I didn't have. I walked to a gas station where a man with a gun in his back pocket got me a tow truck. I gave the driver one of my beers. His chapped hands bled. In the cold cab smelling of french fries and oil, I tried to joke, but he wasn't joking. Halfway home, I calculated the cost of the tow plus the drive shaft was worth more than the car. He dropped it in the street, yellow lights circling over bricks. Some people looking out, I could see. Despite the beer, he overcharged me. Orange lights racing caution through my gut, my wallet entirely too thin. He threatened to take the car back to the garage till I paid the rest. I waited him out. We both knew the car wasn't worth shit. I had two beers left and I gave him one. After he drove away, I sat on the curb pulling pieces of rust out of the door. Tomorrow I'd make the rounds of junkyards looking for a drive shaft with my sincerity and bad check. That week I'd applied for jobs as a janitor, bus boy, ice cream man. I was hoping for the ice cream job a little joy behind the wheel, a little white truck, bells ringing through clean suburbs. I made a little tower of rust on the manhole cover. Everything seemed that fragile. Lying in wet snow, I clamped a tin can over my broken exhaust pipe to hold it together, a bean can. Sucking on the tailpipe, taking a deep sleep. That rusty thought gnawed me while I sat next to the car, going no place. I like to play it down, that melodramatic night. It's like when you see the flashers and think it's the cops or an ambulance, but it's only a tow truck hauling away another junker. A few months later, I got a decent job, but drove that old car longer than I had to, 
held on to it like a nubby candle, afraid getting rid of it would jinx my luck. I had to lie a little to get the job, but like the bean can, it was just another stretch. I got a hundred for it because it started and ran. Sold it to a man who knew all about tin cans. We shook hands in the street. I gave him a block of wood I used to hold the heater vent open. A little something solid, a little gift. A couple jobs that some of you may have had before, tend to be, a lot of early jobs tend to be in uh, working in hamburger joints. This poem is called Short Order Cook. It's a highlight of one of the years of <coughs> back in the 70s. Short Order Cook. An average Joe comes in and orders 30 cheeseburgers and 30 fries. I wait for him to pay before I start cooking. He pays. He ain't no average Joe. The grill is just big enough for 10 rows of three. I throw the burgers down, throw two bucks of fries in the deep fryer, and they pop, pop, spit, spit. Psst. The counter girls laugh. I concentrate. It is a crucial point. They're ready for the cheese. My fingers shake as I tear off slices, toss them on the burgers, fries done, dump, refill buckets, burgers ready, flip in the buns, beat that melting cheese, wrap burgers in the plastic, in the paper rags, fries done, dump, fill 30 bags, bring them to the counter, wipe sweat on sleeve, and smile at the counter girls. I puff my chest out and bellow, 30 cheeseburgers, 30 fries. They look at me funny. I grab a handful of ice, toss it in my mouth, do a little dance, and walk back to the grill. Pressure, responsibility, success. 30 cheeseburgers, 30 fries. <laughs> and this next poem is set in that job, too. It's called May's Poem. I want to write a poem about something beautiful. I tell May the cook. On my break from the grill, I stand against the open kitchen door, getting stoned. That shit make you stupid. May wrinkles her forehead in waves of disapproval. I don't need to be smart to work here, I say. The grease sticks to my skin, a slimy reminder what my future holds. I thought you was going to be a writer. What about that beautiful poem? I take a long hit and pinch out the joint. You'll end up no good like my boy Gerald, she says. May, I'm going to make you a beautiful poem, I say. And I turn and grab her and hug her to me, pick her up and twirl her in circles, our sweaty uniforms sticking together, her large breasts heaving in my face as she laughs and laughs. And the waitresses all come back, and the dishwasher who never smiles makes a noise that could be half a laugh. But she's heavy, and I have to put her down. The manager stands there. Playtime's over. Break's over, he says. Everyone walks away, goes back to work. This isn't my beautiful poem, I know. My poem would have no manager, no end to breaks. My poem would have made her lighter. My poem would have never put her down. I live right in Pittsburgh, and sometimes it's a choice about staying in the city despite some of the uh, dangers and inconveniences. I have two little kids now, ages three and one and a half. So you start reevaluating everything in light of that. <coughs> this poem's called The Hoagie Scam. I don't know if they do that around here, but. A hoagie scam is somebody comes to your door and sells, tells you they're selling hoagies and they take your money and you never get your hoagie. Uh, the hoagie scam. Two kids in baggy jeans are at the door selling hoagies for the church. They're putting something bad in the water, one kid says. Church wants to stop it. Makes us a little crazy, the other kid says. Their eyeballs are moons wide open to all things dark. In other words, blind on smoked rocks. Yeah, we got some good hoagies, pure hoagies. They're laughing at each other like I, I'm not even there, holding the, no, the door open to November cold, my wife and kid dropping pots and pans behind me in the kitchen as I firmly pull the door toward me. Hey, man, buy our hoagies. We need to sell lots of hoagies. Back on track, the other chimes in, for the church, for new uniforms. They look 17 plus 5 for bad behavior. One kid grabs the door. He's in my face. I give them each a dollar. That's half a hoagie, one says, only half. But I guess that's good enough for now. I'm mad enough to ask about delivery. They're mad enough to write down my order on a scrap of paper. It's for a good cause, they both say. I like the girls and the chocolate pretzels better, more subtle, almost believable. Why do I even answer the door? The neighbors don't. 
I stand in the gray fog of dusk and watch them walk away. I try not to be afraid or foolish, crunching over the rubble of city streets. My child in the kitchen is growing up here. I'll have to tell him something about God soon, and hoagie salesmen from the moon, and lost hearts fluttering away, and lost hopes stumbling over city bridges. I'm trying to put a few leaves back in the trees, I tell my wife. We need those leaves, she says. I make my own hoagie for a late night snack, just to remember what one tastes like. I slather on the mustard. Outside, my porch light burns bright. This next one is called the stigmata. You know the stigmata is where you get the marks of the crucifixion in your hands and the side of and the feet <coughs> uh, as a sign of your saintliness. You know, one of the things I guess I think about sometimes is, well, what does it mean to, to live a good life? I'm sure we all think about that at various points. And, this whole idea of there being signs of somebody being a good person is something I'm playing around with in this poem a little bit, the stigmata. I've been writing checks all afternoon while melting snow wumps down off my roof, shaking my six-month-old son. My eating bill's up this year. I mean, I mean heating, I mean, I mean eating. I'm heating up some soup and slicing a sweet pickle. It's still, but I'm writing sweet because my son's smiling because the bills are licked and stamped for another month. My earliest memory is humiliation, getting stuck in diapers again after an accident. How many times will I humiliate my young son? I'm signing my name today with a pen from a hotel in Florida. I squeeze it to get some heat. It's March here in the north. I switch to my Pittsburgh Steelers pen. The snow is melting after all, wet splotches on the street below. A man pokes holes in the snow with his cane, inching down an unshoveled sidewalk. He's moving to the rhythm guitar on my radio. A gray hair slips onto my sandwich. My son reaches for the newspaper. He likes the rustling. News today, a Christmas tree that won't die. An old couple slain in their home, their dogs left out overnight in the storm. I never want to humiliate anyone a deep sting inside, lying in bed trying to find the cool side of the pillow, something to ease the burn of hard words, a veined forehead scowling, a smart-ass remark, muffled laughter. I look for signs of saintliness everywhere, but there's no telling who's good at any given moment. So why would God dish out tattoos to saints like they'd made Eagle Scout or something? How many stayed up all night carving small X's into their palms and feet? That's how good we want to be. I quit scouts when I was only a tenderfoot. After they dumped garbage on my head at camp, I said, who needs this shit? Quit and got a paper out so I could buy a decent radio and spend my weekends hanging on street corners, the true campsites of this world. I hope my son knows when to, sh when to say, who needs this shit, and never has to say it to me. I hope when I'm poking a cane into the snow, he's opening the door for me at the top of the steps. Signs? I've got no signs to prove my worth. Some nights, I carve my sins inside with a pen that never runs out of ink. I carve out my name onto bills overdue, bills imagined, bills doubtful, bills gnawing with hunger and fear. A sweet pickle on the plate, a smiling baby, a pen at room temperature, the snow whumping down, punctuating the day like painful memories. But after a while, we get used to them, my son and I. And we just keep on playing as I envision the year's first flowers, and he, he has no idea heading into his first spring. As you heard in the introduction, I am and have been teaching for quite a while at a university. And some of you know they have this uh, system in the universities called the tenure system, which means at some point the people you work with all get together and vote on whether you get to stay there or not. And that can really breed a sense of paranoia in terms of <coughs> uh, just thinking about what everybody's thinking about you. And so I created this character called the tenured guy who uh, the whole system sort of gets the best of him in terms of a, a series of compromises to, to, to try not to offend anyone. Tenured guy. I have smiled and said hello in the hallways. I have lost sleep over brief exchanges. I have changed pants just to pick up my mail, and I have gotten tenure. 
<laughs> I've kept my one good pair of shoes and my corduroy sport coat in my office just in case. I have nodded at the names of authors I have not and will never read and I have gotten tenure. <laughs> I have kept my nose clean, literally. I have sipped my wine at department parties and receptions thing just long enough. I have sat in the back at lectures far enough away to really not hear and I have nodded astutely. I have never asked a question or disagreed with anyone in any of the long meetings of the living dead and I have gotten tenure. I have served on committees with a smile, oh, always with a smile. I have blended into the beige paint. I have become the beige paint, subtly so subtly, I'm not quite sure where the paint stops and I begin. I've gotten tenure and it's my own fault. <laughs> Even as I write this, I'm not sure anyone will ever see it, but why should I care now that I've gotten tenure? I'm so used to caring, I don't know if I can stop. I've rounded off my grades upward to avoid the student complaint and I've gotten tenure. I've been a nice guy in class, the students majoring and whining, and I've gotten tenure. I've published bad work, and I've gotten tenure. I've padded my vita, what I used to call my resume, and I've gotten tenure. I don't have a skilled trade. I've been paid to do one thing most of my adult life. My friend Tom quit teaching and became a waiter, only to get his jaw busted after work by an unknown assailant. He once said the ideal job would be to teach half the time and haul garbage the other half. He's teaching again now. I have kept secrets, I have covered up, I have been bored to death, I have been attacked by unknown assailants behind my back. I have started to grit my teeth, grind my teeth, I'm wearing them down, the fangs are dulling, but I have tenure. Half my friends hate me for getting tenure, they think I'm lucky or that I sold out. Maybe they're just jealous or maybe I'm just paranoid. I would like workman's comp for paranoia. I've been injured on the job, I've been injured on the way to tenure, I've gotten lost on the way to tenure. I'm still waiting for the official letter, still waiting for the map, still waiting to find my way home. I've cut back on my contractions, cut back on my aints and yas. I've discussed my work in an intellectual fashion. I've talked about my place in American literature. I've talked about breaking new ground. I once said all I wanted to do was teach and write. A full professor laughed at that. How naive, I'm sure she was thinking. Maybe someday I'll be a full guy and I'll be, be able to sit with the other full guys and full gals and have a full meeting. Oh, I have a hard on just thinking about it. I have tenure, did I tell you that? I explained it to my family and they nod. You can never be fired, great. <laughs> oh, I am in the club now. My referees have blown their whistles in my support. I am studying the secret handshakes and codes. I am growing a beard so I can stroke it wisely while I vote on another person's fate. When you see me walking down the hall, say, hey, there's the tenured guy. And I will give you my little tenured wave. Not too exuberant, just so long, so high. <laughs> and I'd like to finish up with uh, two poems with the same title, just to confuse you a little bit. They're both called Faith. And I guess the, in this new book, Blessing the House book, I'm trying to look at faith in a lot of different kinds of ways. Maybe you saw from the a hoagie scam and the stigmata poems, but uh, this first faith, uh, I'll just read faith, uh, number one, I guess. <clears throat> we bomb teachers with snowballs as they walked back from a meeting in the school hall. A hundred kids got the paddle, one sweating nun with a sore arm. Whap, whap, God on her side. In eighth grade, I did not believe in a God that humorless and stern, but I told the truth, took my hits. I stopped saying prayers at night, but kept on with my speech drills, kneeling, folded over the side of the bed, prayers for this life with their clear consequence. Trying to stuff Palm Sunday palms behind the crucifix, I broke off Jesus. The dog grabbed him and ran, held on like he was a prized bone. I pried open his jaws. We kept that empty cross on the wall. I believed if I closed my door gently enough to hear the click, my sick grandmother in the next room would not die. Speak, speak, I told the dog. He just stared. I have lost my memory of gospels and sins, but I have saved the idea of ashes. The priest rubbing them in Ash Wednesday made sure I knew I was dying too. Once I saw a child's shoe lying among irons and broken glass. I wish I could carry that shoe in my pocket. I wish we all carried one of those shoes. I don't think I've been seen rubbing dirt on my forehead random spring mornings, but I have done it. 
I have faith in my own death, that icy snowball. I'll take my hits, but I won't enjoy them. I'll take my hits, I remind myself, all those doors slamming behind me. Wep, wep. This last poem, as I said, is also called Faith. I wrote a silver dollar from 1928, the year of my parents' birth, distant and unimaginable as the sun's surface. Sun warm in the window, radiator heat against my feet, outside snow glowing, melting. Sun warm in the window, bright over snow, bright over snow, warm in the window. 1962, my head against the rug, soft fur. I watch dust motes float in sunlight, streaming in like grace. Afternoons, I sleep next to my mother, my baby sister, sun slicing through beneath the shade into the silence of our breathing. A house key, a gift for my 16th birthday, symbolic weight heavy in my hands, worn smooth now, bent into a caress. The silver dollar increases in value like the key. I could rub away the date if I'm not careful. Some Christians call themselves born again. They'll die once regardless. I spend my life like a rare coin. My parents' skin loosens its grip on bone. I hold my key, put it in the lock. Sometimes I did it drunk and silently. Sometimes I did it sober and sad. Sometimes I did not want to be home. In this gray, cloudy town, sometimes I address a Lord who may as well be the sun. And today, I give praise for this warmth. Lord, shine down on those who brought me to this world. Pull us through another day. I rub the key, the coin. I believe in them both enough to make the wish. Thanks. Thank you.